Okay, uh, there's not a lot that uh, is given in the notes here regarding calculating probabilities for a general uh, gamma random variable, and that's because uh, unless um, alpha is equal to 1, uh, the process, if you were to do it by hand, is either rather lengthy or it's, it's just not feasible. Uh, it has to be approximated numerically. Uh, if you had a situation where, say, alpha is 4, uh, regardless of what beta is, you could do the integration, but you'd have to go through multiple uh, repetitions of integration by parts, and, and that's not the purpose here. So, uh, just as an example here, uh, if we had a gamma 4.2 and we were looking for the probability that y is less than or equal to 3.5, by the way, that notation, uh, the first value is alpha, the second value is beta. Gone through the calculation of, of the constant here, which is 1 over 96. So there's our density, and uh, there is the integration that you would have to perform. Again, you're going to either be using um, your calculator for doing that, or for homework purposes, if you want to use Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha, any of that's fine. Just remember to uh, write down what you put in and, and give me your appropriate output. So uh, now, uh, we'll do the alpha equals one case uh, in a couple of sheets, but that's that for now. Okay, now, mean and variance. Uh, this is where the, uh, the kernel becomes important. So, um, as mentioned before, if you take the integral of the kernel over the entire domain, uh, for a gamma in this case, zero to infinity, uh, you get the reciprocal of the constant, which is uh, shown right there. So what we've got here are the derivation of the expected value of y and the expected value of y squared. And the reason that the kernel is so important is if you take a look at what we've got there with the extra y put in, I've pulled out the constant, and if you take a look at what we've got right here, you'll see that uh, we have a gamma kernel. It's of the form y to the something minus 1 e to the negative y divided by a constant. Uh, so in this case, the something minus 1, that something is alpha plus 1, and again we've got divided by beta. So this is a gamma kernel where uh, the first parameter is alpha plus 1, the second one is beta. And so if you were to integrate that, what you get is the reciprocal evaluated at those values. So we have instead of gamma of alpha, we have gamma of alpha plus 1, and instead of beta to the alpha, we have beta to the alpha plus 1. So what we've got are, what we have is that expression evaluated at the appropriate arguments right there, as you can see. Okay, so we have that times the, uh, the constant that was pulled outside, and now we're going to use the rules that we had after we do some canceling, some basic canceling. We've got gamma to the alpha plus 1 times beta divided by gamma of alpha. Uh, and as far as that's concerned, we're going to use rule 2, the recurrence relation, to write gamma of alpha plus 1 as alpha to the, uh, al sorry, alpha times gamma of alpha. We can cancel the gamma of alpha, and we're left with alpha times beta. So that's the mean. For the expected value of y squared, similar process, except instead of alpha plus 1, we have alpha plus 2. And as you can see right there, we had to use the, we could do some canceling. We've got beta squared because we had beta the alpha plus 2 over beta the alpha. Uh, and if we use the recurrence relation, we're going to have to use it twice uh, to get down to gamma of alpha and this reduces down to alpha plus 1 times alpha times beta squared. The rest is just the, uh, the algebra to go ahead and get you to the variance, which works out to be alpha times beta squared. And so if you go back to those first three examples that I showed you, um, on page 4, I just took the values of alpha and beta, plugged them into the formulas that we had, uh, to get you the mean and the variance of the um, random variables, of, of these three different random variables. Uh, one thing to notice here, because 
The mean is alpha times beta, and the variance is alpha times beta squared. The only way the variance is going to be smaller than the mean is if beta is between 0 and 1, um, non-inclusive. So, okay, so that's the, the mean and the variance. Now, in both sections, uh, four, three, sorry, four, six, and four, seven, you're going to see some problems like this, where you're told that um, y is a random variable with a certain distribution. They'll give you the parameter values, and then they'll basically define another function. It could be a cost function. It could be something else, as a uh, function of y. And what you need to get are the mean and the variance of that new random variable. Okay. Uh, in the case of, well, first off, we've got the, uh, given that we've got alpha and beta here, you've got the calculations of the expected value of y squared and the expected value of y, just plug and chug, those are 6 and 48. Uh, as far, and although I didn't put it on here, uh, remember that the variance of y would be uh, 3 times 2 squared, so that would end up being 12. Okay, so using our rules uh, for means and variances, uh, the expected value of c is just straightforward because c in this case is a quadratic function. We have both the expected value of y and the expected value of y squared, so that's just plug and chug, and you get 112. Okay, for the variance of c, we now need the expected value of c squared minus the square of the mean of c. Uh, so eventually we're going to subtract 112 squared, but for the expected value of c squared, we actually have to multiply out the expression uh, for c. Uh, we've got to square that, and what we end up getting here is a fourth degree polynomial. Uh, we can then use our rules to get the expected value of c squared as uh, that expression right there. Uh, we can do some plug and chug right now because we have e of y and e of y squared, but we don't have e of y cubed and e of y to the fourth. So we go through that derivation again, uh, and this is similar to the derivation of the expected value of y squared uh, and the expected value of y, except in this case we're plugging in y, uh, y cubed and also y to the fourth in each case. I've pulled out the 1 over 16. And in these two cases, what we're left with on the inside, we still have gammas, except uh, now the parameters uh, for the expected value of y cubed, we're working with a gamma 6, 2. And for the expected value of y to the fourth, we're working with a gamma 7, 2. So again, here, if you uh, plug in the values 6 and 2 into the reciprocal of the constant, uh, we get the, the formulas that work out there and we get our specific values. We then go down here and at this point it's basically number crunching uh, from that point on. So that's how you work uh, that type of problem. Okay, now I said there was one special case that we're going to focus on which is the exponential distribution. This is what occurs when uh, for a gamma when alpha is equal to 1. As you can see, the density uh, is reduced there to 1 over beta times e to the negative y over beta. We have an actual exponential function, hence the name. Now, we could go through the derivation of the mean and the variance, but you just have to remember that an exponential uh, is just a special case of a gamma. So, if you just plug alpha uh, equals 1 uh, into the formulas for the, the mean and the variance of a general uh, gamma, what you end up getting is that the mean is beta, the variance is beta squared, and hence the standard deviation is beta. So this is the only random variable for which uh, both the mean and the standard deviation are always equal to one another. Okay. Uh, another thing about this is that you could go through integration every time you have a probability calculation to do, but the CDF for, a, uh, for an exponential works out rather nicely. We've got the derivation here, but what you'll notice uh, when we go through all of this is that the CDF works out to be 1 minus e to the negative y over beta, uh, as long as y is greater than 0. Uh, and, and we could have an or equal in there, it doesn't matter. 
uh, in this case because uh, we don't have to worry about this being undefined at zero. And if you want the probability that y is greater than y, well, it's 1 minus the CDF, and that's just e to the negative y over beta. So those calculations end up becoming greatly simplified. There is no exponential distribution function on your calculator, but you also don't need to use the integration. You can just use the, the, the x function on your calculator. So here's an example uh, right here where we're looking at the amount of time uh, to complete checkout in a, uh, an express lane at a grocery store. Notice that it says it follows an exponential distribution with a mean of 4.2 minutes. So the fact that the mean is 4.2 and the fact going along with the fact that the expected value of x, I wrote x not y. Psh, sorry. I had to correct a lot of those. Uh, anyway, is beta. So that's telling you right here, since the mean is 4.2, that is your value of beta. Okay, so we've got some uh, probabilities to calculate. The probability that uh, it takes more than six minutes to complete service, less than three minutes, and then between five and 7.5 minutes. So as far as A is concerned, we're looking at a greater than case. Uh, for the greater than case, we're going to use right there the e to the negative y over b format. So y in this case is 6, beta is 4.2. So e to the negative 6 divided by 4.2 works out to be just a little less than 0.24. For the y less than 3 case, we're going to use the 1 minus e to the negative y over beta form. Plugged everything in there and you get something a little bit more than 0.51. And then for the case where y is between 5 and 7.5, we're going to take the probability that y is less than or equal to 7.5 and subtract out the probability that y is less than 5. Again, that's a, a plug and chug scenario. And we end up getting the answer there, 0 0.1364.